so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. The following episode contains discussions of violence and sexual assault. Listener discretion is advised. It was a Thursday night in December 2001 when a woman named Janine Vaughan attended a nightclub in Bathurst called the Metro Tavern. Janine had lived in the small town with a population of around 27,000 for the last three years, working as a manager at a local menswear shop. Hers was a face that many in the community knew, considered conventionally beautiful with blonde hair, blue eyes and a big smile. On this particular night, or rather the early hours of Friday morning, 31-year-old Janine walked out onto George Street, a few paces ahead of her friends. She was distressed, having lost her handbag somewhere inside the nightclub. A few moments later, a red sedan pulled up. Her friends were unable to see the driver, but assumed it had to be someone Janine knew. She climbed into the passenger seat and the car drove away. That was the last anyone has seen of Janine Vaughan, a woman known as fun-loving and outgoing. Her mother, Jenny Vaughan, told the Sydney Morning Herald in 2012, It was raining. She had no money. She had no phone, no key to get into her house. If it was just someone she knew from coming into the shop or who she knew from around town, she would have got in. It wouldn't have been someone she met that night. I think it's someone that she knew and trusted them enough to get into the car. So, who was in the driver's seat? And what did they do to Janine Vaughan? He was a big man, about six foot tall. He didn't look like he fitted in that car. He looked too big for the car. Dark hair, he had a fair complexion. He had what I'd call a a buff head or a square head. I couldn't tell you what colour eyes he had, but I remember he had a bumpy nose, like pimples. And that stood out to me. I'm Jessie Stevens, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. In today's episode, I'm speaking with investigative journalist and author Hedley Thomas. His new podcast, The Night Driver, produced by The Australian, explores the cold case of Janine Vaughan, who went missing in the regional town of Bathurst. Headley is best known for his work on The Teacher's Pet and has won seven Walkley Awards, including two gold Walkleys. You'll find a link to the Night Driver podcast in our show notes. Let's begin on the night Janine Vaughan disappeared. She was out with friends. How did that night play out? Yeah, she had started at uh, a pub called The Ox, the Oxford Tavern. It was a very popular drinking hole for townies as well as university students. There's this um, interesting mix in Bathurst because of the Charles Sturt University, which draws a lot of students and had a fantastic journalism course back in the day. It probably still does, I'm not sure. But students would socialise with a lot of locals who they called townies at these pubs and the ox was one and then there was the eddy and then there was the metro tavern otherwise known as the dirty tav and janine started at at the ox with some friends and then they moved on to the metro later in the evening and she was with a friend Winita and another friend correct there were sort of three of them that were together for most of the night yeah that's right um janine had a a lot of friends, and after she'd split up with her boyfriend, Phil, and Phil was a guy who was a Bathurst local, an electrician, and he'd asked her to move from her hometown of Musselbrook to be with him in Bathurst. But after living together for some time, it wasn't going the way they had hoped, and they separated, and Janine had made a lot of younger friends. And a lot of these were uni students or younger people who were working in retail with her or in the same shopping centre. And she'd got to know Juanita, Juanita Murphy. And at that time, Juanita's boyfriend was a guy called Jordan Morris. And it was with Juanita and Jordan that she was drinking with. 
at the Metro and dancing and they were having a great night and then it all started to go bad. So the first unfortunate incident of the night was that she lost her handbag and she couldn't find it. What happened there? That was at one of the second place they were, wasn't it, that she lost the handbag? That's right. They'd moved on to the Dirty Tav and a lot of people describe it as this drinking hole of last resort. It had that reputation, but everyone would end up there. You know, it had a nightclub and a pretty interesting clientele, particularly in the early hours of the morning. But at that place, Janine had been dancing and she'd been dancing with, you know, a few people that night, including a police officer who had also been at the Ox. Her handbag was on the ground and it was the custom among staff of the Metro to put handbags away. And hers was put behind a board on the stairs. These were the stairs that would lead up to another section of the nightclub, as well as living quarters for the hotel owner. And behind this board, they'd often put handbags. Hers was put there, but she didn't know it had been put there. And Juanita, her friend, didn't know that it had been put there. And so when Janine went looking for it, she didn't know where it was. And there was a search. No one could find it. And the person who'd put it there wasn't asked. He was a one of the bouncers, he wasn't asked, did he know where the handbag was? He could have said. So because of this, I think, very unfortunate circumstance where just the wrong people weren't around at the time, the people who could have shed light on where the handbag was weren't asked, the handbag just was overlooked. And it was always behind the board, although the cleaner said he believed that it had been concealed somehow. We'll probably never know, but Janine left the Metro Tavern in a very upset state because she couldn't find it. And that meant she didn't have her phone. She didn't have her keys to her house, didn't have keys to open the menswear store, which she managed and where she needed to be for work the next, well, that morning actually. And uh, she didn't have her cash and cigarettes and makeup, just all the things that you would expect to have in your handbag. She was separated from it. She was really distressed. And that leaves you know, a woman especially vulnerable, as you say, without keys and a, a phone. Um, what time was it when she did end up sort of abandoning the search for the bag and walking out of that nightclub? Yeah, it was shortly after 3.40 in the morning. So that's a Friday morning. They'd gone out, you know, for Thursday night drinks. And back then, and possibly still now, a number of the pubs in town would stay open till the wee hours and Janine, you know, it was a bit of a tradition to go out on that Thursday night and Friday nights. And she'd gone to the Metro and the Ox over many weeks. This week should have just been like every other week. But when she left at uh, about 3.40, 3.45 in the morning and walked outside, it was raining. She had planned to go back to the Ox with her friends for what were called staffies, that is, you know, drinks with the staff who had knocked off because the ox had closed and they'd have a few more drinks and then Janine would have grabbed a couple of hours sleep and then turned up for work. But she didn't make it to the ox. She started walking towards the ox. She'd turned into Keppel Street alongside McCaddy Park when a red car pulled up and she got into it. And so that was the last time she was seen, that is contested, but, uh, you know, the last time that her friends saw her walking into that, did her friends witness her getting into that car? Yes. They say they saw the red car come slowly to a stop on the side of the road next to McCaddy Park. And there were only three witnesses to what happened next. One was a guy called Ian Bryant. He was nicknamed Strop. And he was looking down Keppel Street from this flat in a hotel uh, right on the corner. And he said that he saw this small red car stop and Janine get into it and then the car drove off. And then Jordan and Juanita, they were walking a short distance behind Janine. She'd walked ahead of them because Jordan and Juanita were having a little row, a little lover's tiff, and they were distracted while talking. And so Janine just stepped ahead and they saw her get into the car as well. And they didn't know who was driving. I think at first they probably assumed that she was just 
getting into a car that was driven by someone she knew who might drop her at the ox because that was their intention. They were going there together and they went to the ox and Janine wasn't there and they were a bit worried about her, but they didn't know where she was. And the next day, Janine didn't open the store in the local shopping center and the alarm was raised. And from that point, everyone was on high alert. Is it still understood that the person who Janine got into the car with, she likely knew prior because there's a lot of discussion in the podcast about whether she was the type of person who would, you know, who was trusting of strangers and might have just jumped into a car. This was, you know, a while ago. So things have changed. But also, you know, there are some people who who might not hesitate. But there's reason to believe that Janine wouldn't have just stepped into a car with a stranger, right? Yes, that's one of the most consistent themes that people describe in relation to Janine. They all say that there's no way she would have got into a car driven by a stranger. She had a lot of street sense and she was very wary. She'd had some terrible experiences herself with predatory men. She'd also had uh, a stalker who had been leaving notes for her over many months and had mailed her or had sent to her black women's underwear, these notes that were left for her on her car and in her letterbox were threatening and she was really agitated about all that. So she was not going to just get into a stranger's car. That's what everybody from her sister and and brothers, her parents, her friends, colleagues from the shopping centre, they all say that to me. Janine would not have got into a car with someone she didn't know. Everyone's Mm. adamant about it. Her family, Mm. her friends, uh, the friends that were here with her that night, her her previous partner says exactly the same thing. They know her. The people who know her Mm. best all say she would not have got into that car with someone she didn't know. But on the other hand, it's 10 to 4 in the morning It's raining. She's separated from her handbag. She had obviously been drinking and she's tired. She's fed up and a car stops. Is it possible that she got in without knowing the driver? I I agree with one of the police officers I interviewed who, who said, it is possible and we'll never know unless we can identify the perpetrator and he or she tells us what happened. But certainly amongst people who knew Janine well, they were adamant that because of the way she'd been raised and her own life experiences, she's not the kind of person who would thumb a ride or get into a stranger's car. And that's one of the chilling parts about this story because it means that the person who abducted and almost certainly killed her is someone she knew and therefore someone that others out with Janine that night or who worked and lived and loved her knew that person too. You mentioned that she'd been receiving letters, phone calls from someone who was believed to be a a stalker of some kind. Did she go to police with her concerns about this person? She did. She went to police on a number of occasions about the stalker's notes and she also talked to her doctor about it because she was very anxious and needed some counselling and and even some anti-anxiety medication for it. She spoke to a number of friends about it and her own family and regrettably there was a, a suspicion amongst, well, only one, maybe two people that I've talked to that she could have been embellishing that, exaggerating it, or even inventing it to, I think, uh, and this was the theory of the persons who su- suggested this, that she could have been inventing it to ensure that her then boyfriend, Phil, didn't go away so much for work, leaving her alone. Now, I think that the police came to a view that the stalking was real and that Janine was genuinely very scared. But we don't know whether the person who was stalking her is the person who rolled up in that red car and picked her up. You would think that if it is the same person, Janine couldn't have known that that 
person in the red car was the person writing the stalking notes, otherwise she wouldn't have got in the car. But it's again one of the, the mysteries of this case. So Janine didn't have any sense or any hunches about who that person might have been. It was just that she knew she was being pursued by this, you know, stranger who was writing notes. That's right. I've seen the notes and we've read them out in the podcast. They're handwritten. I've got a handwriting expert who's currently examining those notes and I'm hoping to get some feedback on that for our final episodes. But to our knowledge, Janine didn't offer any names to the police in terms of who might have been behind the stalking. What happened to a woman named Lynette Borland in the hours before Janine went missing? Yeah, this is a really significant feature of of the police investigation involving Janine because Lynette Borland was walking through the centre of Bathurst about 10 minutes, 15 minutes before Janine got into that red car. So Lynette's walking on the other side of McCaddy Park and she'd been visiting friends. They'd recently had a baby and she was catching up with them and As it rained, she wanted to get home to her farm because she had pets there and they needed looking after. She started walking off. She she wasn't driving because she had some issues with her license at that time. And she was used to thumbing rides. And her plan was to get down to the service station where she knew some of the truckies would stop and she would get a lift out to her farm. Again, early hours of the morning. And, you know, it's, it's hard to believe that people would be thumbing rides, women alone at that time. But that's what Lynette was accustomed to doing and she was prepared to take her chances. But as she was walking through Bathurst, a small red car pulled up and Lynette really had a lot of street sense, probably a lot more than Janine. And Lynette became very quickly alarmed at the approach that was made to her by the driver of that little red car. And She fled and hid behind a metal box that was on the street. The car did a lap of the block and came back around and and she was determined to flee this vehicle because she could tell the driver was up to no good. He stopped. He asked her, did she want to have a lift? He was trying to get her in the car and she was so concerned. She wrote down the um, number plate of the car. She on a piece of paper, she got to the service station and the CCTV footage from that service station actually includes audio and you can hear her in this footage talking about this small red car that's been stalking her and she was really scared by it. But she waited for a truck driver and got a lift back to her place and and she wasn't going to do any more about it. And then Janine and her disappearance became big news and and one of Lynette's friends said look you had this incident you really need to tell the police what happened to you it's probably the same driver so she then went and made her statement to the police and the police have been confident since soon after that that the same driver the same red car was responsible for the incident involving Lynette Borland And then 10 minutes later, the pickup of Janine Vaughan. But again, it's not certain. There's a lot of conjecture around this. It's also possible, even though it's a big coincidence, that um, there could be two red cars out that night, one of which was driven by the man who tried to get Lynette Ballen into the car and terrified her in the process, and another, completely unrelated, driven by someone who Janine knew, who she thought she could trust, she gets into his car and something happens and she's never seen again. So we just don't know, but certainly the police have been of the view that it's one car, one driver. And I mentioned that Lynette wrote down the details you know, from the number plate, but she gave the piece of paper away when She'd met a guy the following week and put down some contact details for herself on that. And it was on that piece of paper and they couldn't track that guy down. So they weren't able to follow through on that. Did she have a description, uh, even loosely, of of the man in the car? Yeah, she did. She gave a pretty good description. He was tall. He was strongly built. 
she said he had a bit of like a buff head. He had some kind of condition on his nose. He was wearing a white shirt, collar shirt, um, black trousers. He seemed to be reasonably well spoken. She said he had uh, hairy arms and... I also saw that he had a bracelet, identification bracelet on his right wrist. And he had a watch on as well with a stretchy band. And then I think what made me get frightened was I thought he took his hand, his right hand off the steering wheel, and it appeared to me he was going to wind his window down. And I got frightened and I moved towards the back of the car. I stepped down and walked around the back of the car quickly and then crossed the road and kept going down William Street. One other thing she said was that the license plate, the number plate, looked like some of the numbers were sort of running in the rain as if tyre blacker or something had been used to paint them on. And she was a car detailer herself, had been for years. And she said this was very unusual. There was something really off about the plates. And, you know, I think that that's led police and and others to believe that the plates might have been disguised. Uh, The numbers changed with tyre blacker so that if there was an identification, it wouldn't lead to the registered owner. Again, we won't know, and and sadly, Lynette's died, so we can't learn any more from her. In the days afterwards, a sharp knife was found, and it looked to have blood and hair on it. And this is in, you know, a case of a 31-year-old has gone missing. There's a community who is searching for her. This appears to potentially be some sort of murder weapon. Was that knife tested, and if so, was anything ever found? Yeah, the the knife was found discarded near a driveway in Bathurst, and only a few days after Janine had disappeared, at a time when police were very concerned for Janine's well-being, they were already fearing the worst. And a member of the public who, who had found the knife called the police. The police went out, uh, picked it up, followed all the procedures, used gloves, put it in a bag and took it back to the station. And the knife had what appeared to be hairs on it and blood and therefore should have been sent away for careful analysis, forensic analysis, for fingerprints and DNA and everything you would expect of a possible murder weapon. We don't know if it was a murder weapon. It might have been completely unrelated to Janine's disappearance. But extraordinarily, that knife was destroyed while in police custody in what we think was just a monumental screw-up. Instead of it being put with a batch of evidence relating to Janine Vaughan's disappearance, it was just entered as kind of you know unclaimed general property. And after a few months, that property, if it's not claimed by the owners, is destroyed. And so this, this knife, which could have been a really important piece of evidence, was, um, I believe it was incinerated, and that was before any testing had been done. The knife almost feeds into one of the most prominent theories that still exists within the Bathurst community. And that surrounds the town's former lead detective and deputy mayor, Brad Hosemans. And because of his proximity to the police force, you know, it's just given way to an enormous amount of conspiracy theories that perhaps he destroyed the knife or he was able to shirk responsibility because of how powerful he was in the community at that time. How did that theory pick up traction? Did he have a car that matched the description? Did he know Janine? Why was it that he attracted so much attention? Yeah, it's a really good question, Jess. Brad Hosemans was the deputy mayor of Bathurst, as well as being the detective sergeant and the investigations manager for the the police district. And he was a man with huge ambition. He saw a potential political career ahead of him. He was also very popular with women and clearly with ratepayers who voted him in. But he had a reputation as being a real ladies' man. And he was in the shopping centre 
one day talking to a friend of his in a shop called Fashion Fair. Her name's Rachel. And he was asking about Janine, who was working across the way at Ed Harry's. And, and he said, oh, you know, she looks really nice. Who's she? And what's her story? And Rachel said, oh, that's Janine. You should ask her out. He said, oh, no, thank you. And he, you know, moved on. But um, because of that conversation and because of his own mishaps and, and trouble he'd got into at a notorious night at the Bathurst Golf Club a few months earlier where he and a bunch of other cops were um, accused of wrongdoing, of getting really drunk and, and rowdy. And then he was accused of groping a female member of the bar staff. All of that... Um, built up and so that when Janine went missing and he was involved in the early investigations the town's rumor mill started working overtime with this idea that he had been responsible for Janine's disappearance that he was obsessed with her and that he had stalked her and that to cover his tracks he had destroyed the knife by that stage he had been charged over the golf club incident and he denied that he'd done anything wrong and, and he was ultimately acquitted in the local court some months later. But um, because of his early connection to the case and because of this comment that he had made to a friend about Janine and everyone started talking about that and it built up and up, he became the number one suspect for the community. And the coppers who were investigating, you know, coming from Sydney, it was the homicide squad, they were like poo-pooing this idea and the more that they kind of tried to play it down, the more that locals became incensed and believed that the police were covering it up, just as they'd covered up the murder weapon, the knife, which, as we you know have said, may or may not have had anything to do with it. But Brad Hosemans has had now 19 years of being branded the murderer in that town, and his insistence is that he never talked to Janine Vaughan he never met her. He never asked her out. He never sent her flowers. There was never any connection at all between him and her. And, you know, he's paid a very heavy price because of this innuendo. I've done a lot of investigating through this case, trying to determine whether there are connections between Janine and Brad Hosemans, trying to see if there's any evidence to support the innuendo. And I can't find a skerrick. And nobody can say, I saw them together. Even, you know, her best friends and her family members say, yeah, we, we don't think they ever actually had a date. You know, we know that Brad was interested, but nothing happened. So it's just one of the most intriguing parts of this case. And I think the focus on Brad Hosemans for such a long time really destroyed the ability of police to win the public's trust because the public just believed he'd done it and that the cops were covering up for him. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Jessie Stevens. In today's episode, I'm speaking with investigative journalist and author Hedley Thomas. His new podcast, The Night Driver, explores the cold case of Janine Vaughan, who went missing in the regional town of Bathurst. There's one woman as well who came forward about four and a half years later to say that she actually saw something involving Brad Hosemans. And if this is the case and it's highly contested, then she might have actually been the last person to see Janine Vaughan alive what does she claim she saw a few days after Janine went missing? Yeah, so a woman who was codenamed by police authorities, the Police Integrity Commission, they codenamed her RA1 because she said she was very concerned for her family and didn't want her identity known. And she came forward, as you say, about four and a half years after Janine disappeared and said that while reading the local newspaper, she'd had this sudden flashback to this day that she was driving near Bathurst and she saw a red car coming towards her. And in that car, she recognised Janine Vaughan with her hands, which appeared to be bound with bailing twine, up above the dashboard and a frantic, distressed look on her face and Brad Hosman's at the wheel of the car. And of course, this was extraordinary 
information and many people wondered why such incredible eyewitness information wouldn't have gone to the police right at the start. Uh, Janine's disappearance was a big local event. It was heavily publicised almost from the first day. And this woman hadn't come forward in four and a half years. But um, when the investigators uh, who, who interviewed her really drilled deeply into her account, it started to unravel. One of the reasons for it unraveling was she said that when she saw the red car coming towards her, she immediately recognised it as a car that was owned by her son's friend. He'd recently bought it, she said. And the investigation showed that, in fact, he hadn't bought that car for some six months after this incident that the woman described and, and dated as having occurred just a couple of days after Janine disappeared. So, so that bit was clearly wrong. This woman also had struggles herself with mental health and depression related issues and she was on medication and I think that after her story was given a lot of public play and there were public hearings which revolved around her evidence in Bathurst and these must have been incredibly damaging for the police investigation, not to mention for Brad Hosemans who said, I don't know what the hell she's talking about. The investigators and the official inquiry concluded that she was a completely unreliable witness and and sadly, while she probably believed what she was saw, it was a fantasy. So it didn't go anywhere. But um, I think all of that just contributed to the public's lack of trust in police. And again, despite the woman's account being discredited, I think that people suspected Brad Hosman's even more as a result of that being peddled. Mm, it uh, sort of does damage regardless of whether or not it's determined to be true. There was actually a murder confession at one stage by a man named Dennis Briggs, which seems to be just about as incriminating as you can get. What did he say? Who did he confess to and what did he say occurred on the night that Janine disappeared? Yeah, Dennis Briggs was obviously quite obsessed with Janine. He would spend a lot of time and money in her menswear store just because he really liked going in to see her. He worked in an aged care home. He was in a relationship with a woman called Julie. And a couple of nights after Janine had disappeared, he went and saw Julie and he was talking to her about Janine Vaughan. And Julie was like, well, who's Janine Vaughan? And Dennis said, you know, the woman who's gone missing, I know what happened to her. And to cut a long story short, he told Julie and a number of other friends with whom he used to drink at the RSL club. I took her to White Rock or a river at White Rock. I tried to fuck her and she was fighting me off. I got my knife out. Sorry, correct that. I got my knife and gave her one in the side to try and quieten her down. I fuck her or I fucked her. Stabbed her 14 times. She would not die. So I slit her throat. And then he then um, covered her with rocks went back the next day and either buried her or threw her down a well, depending on which account you believe, because he told a number of people this horrific story. And the people he told were convinced that he was telling the truth and that he had killed Janine. And they then reported it to police. And the police checked out his car and couldn't find any trace of Janine in the car. They, they examined it carefully. And they also believed that Dennis, while he had criminal form and when he was off his medication, could potentially have done something like this, it also you know went the other way in that when he was off his medication, he could have delusions of things as horrific as murder. And so he could have just made it up. And the police, in the absence of evidence, decided that Dennis had just made this up, this whole story, even though there were all these other boxes that he ticked. He had the right car. He was obsessed with Janine, visiting her store all the time. He got rid of his car soon afterwards. He had some concerning criminal history, but they couldn't find any evidence that would directly link him to Janine's disappearance, other than what he had 
told people. And he then, of course, retracted that. And I interviewed Dennis Briggs at length, uh, along with Brad Hoseman, so I mean separately, but I um, came away from my interviews with Brad Hoseman believing that he's got absolutely nothing to do with Jenny's disappearance. But with Dennis Briggs, you know, you can't, <laughs> you just can't rule him out, even though I think the police did. It seems that there's still a cloud of doubt around him because, as you say, he appears to be impossible to rule out, although there's no tangible evidence that can link him to the case. It is such an unusual thing to do, to confess to a crime with these horrendous details if it's not something that you did, which I think was is a really difficult thing as a listener of the podcast to get your head around. And the third man, Andrew Jones, it, who is brought into the podcast as a potential person who may have been involved, he drove a small red car and is considered to potentially be connected. What was his story? Yeah, Andrew Jones um, is a man who had really gone under the radar the public radar in this case for a number of years, even when he gave evidence at the inquest in 2009. He's a pharmacist who worked in the pharmacy very close to Janine's menswear store. And he had been a locum pharmacist at a number of pharmacies in the region. He had uh, accommodation, a room at the local, um, the Scott School, which was the private school in Bathurst. And very committed to his Bible and, and Christian beliefs, he he would socialize with friends from the church that uh, he attended. And he said that he had been working in Lithgow that day that, that Janine was out, and that he came home to Bathurst, did some private Bible study with his friend David Coy, and then went back to the Scott School about 9.30 p.m., went to bed and had the next day off, and he can't remember what he did on the Friday, and that's the Friday that Janine disappeared. The early hours of that Friday morning she disappeared, I should say. For a while I wondered why had he become such a significant person of interest in the police investigation, and you know, in reading the files at the inquest and reading the transcript evidence, you can see that the police and the senior counsel assisting the coroner, when it comes to Andrew Jones, are expressing a view that um, while they certainly can't make any adverse finding against him, they're definitely expressing concerns about him, partly on the basis of confidential information in a statement given by one of the investigating detectives of the strike force. And this information was not publicly disclosed at the time, so it must have been operational. But I didn't have access to that. But then as my investigations were unfolding, I heard from several women, three women in fact, two of whom I interviewed on the record and they're in the podcast, and they talked about Andrew Jones trying to persuade them in unusual circumstances in their view to go in his red car with him. One of these um, witnesses at the time was a 17-year-old um, student of the Scott School and it was school holidays, it was a week after Janine had disappeared and she gives, I think, a very persuasive account of Andrew Jones rolling up. She knew of him because she had seen him around the school grounds and felt that his presence was a bit unusual. He seemed to be spending a lot of time just kind of looking at the female students and hanging around. And then when he asked her, would she like a lift in his red car, she thought that was pretty unusual and, and he persisted and she said no. And and she told her dad at the time and that may well have triggered the police interest in Jones. There was another woman called Trish Salt who had been at the Metro Tavern, the same place where Janine was before she disappeared. Trish had been there the week before Janine disappeared with a, with a girlfriend and she claimed that she was walking to a taxi rank after leaving the Metro and Andrew Jones was in his red car and jumped out and offered her and her girlfriend a lift and again was persisting in that, according to Trish. And I met Trish a couple of times and interviewed her several times and her story was very consistent, very straight. And uh, she said that she told police this 
after Janine disappeared, but they didn't get back to her. Trish declined the lift, and she said that his persistence was such that when they got into a taxi, he was still in his car. And she said to the taxi driver, look, this guy is trying to get us in his car. Can you just wait? I don't know what's going to happen. He might follow us. And so the taxi driver just waited, and eventually the car drove away. Because I know damn well when I spoke to the guy, I said, I am 100% certain his name's Andrew Jones and he works at the chemist in the same shopping centre where Janine used to work. Is that why he became a person of interest? Even though they didn't get back to me. Was there other people that came forward, like, with information on him? It's just really odd to me. But why didn't they follow up with you? I don't know. It's the weirdest thing. This whole investigation is just completely odd to me. It's just been one debacle after another. Now, it's really important to stress, Jess, that Andrew Jones denies that any of these incidents occurred, including the third one involving a woman who was a local woman of Bathurst, in fact, a teenager at the time, and she said that she was out walking near the cemetery when Andrew Jones tried to persuade her to get in his car. But he denies that that these events ever happened. He says he doesn't ever go around asking women he doesn't know to get in his car. He doesn't drive around Bathurst late at night, or he didn't. He doesn't live there anymore. He's not a stalker, and that uh, he's been stitched up by police over many years, and it's ruined his life. And you know he can't believe that he has been dragged into this, and, and his name and reputation have been smeared for many years. So he's adamantly rejected all of these accusations and just wants to get on with his life without the spectre of being you know, a suspect, a person of interest in an unsolved murder. They can test my car as, as much as they want. They won't find anything because um, Janine has never been in my car and I didn't know her. Do you hope the police do find who did this? Definitely, yeah. I, I really hope they do. Are you? Do you feel anything for her family? Well, I definitely. We, uh, you know, like, and that it needs to be solved. Since telling Janine's story and the release of the night driver, have you received tip-offs? Have there been names and places and details that have triggered some people's? memories absolutely you know and and those three women i've just talked to you about are among those Mm. but also there's been really good information that's come in about women being subjected to very concerning assaults and attempted assaults and abductions by other men and i'm investigating those as well because it's also you know very possible that janine's abductor and murderer is someone we've never heard of or we've never heard of in this podcast. And there are a number of men, very dangerous men in Bathurst at that time who haven't been named yet. And there's still quite a bit of work to do in that field. But the podcast is definitely loosening the lips of locals who have information and and who are now seeing it's timely and and right to disclose it. And they're doing that. I wanted to finally ask how confident you are that we will find out what happened to Janine Vaughan on that night? Yeah, look, I've never been saying that there's a very high chance of finding out. You know, there there have been tens of thousands of hours and millions of dollars spent in this investigation by police strike forces, by cold case review detectives, by Police Integrity Commission by an inquest and the state coroner with all the powers that they have and they have not been able to identify Janine's murderer or where her remains are. So, you know, we really are up against it with a podcast and coming in 19 years later to try to to get to the bottom of this. But there is a chance because we are not part of the police of New South Wales. We are independent of the investigators and and the agencies that the locals decided they couldn't trust. And so for those reasons, I think there there is a chance. But, um, you know, I've always said to Kylie, who's Janine's sister, 
and the rest of the family and their friends, you know, we'll give this our best shot, but I don't want to get your hopes up. This is a really tough who done it. It's mystifying. It's baffling. There are so many leads and and paths you can go down and I've been down a lot of them and and you know each time I think we're getting close something new comes up and then there's another suspect and you think oh my gosh how many are there how many possible persons of interest could there be certainly there's the large number and I think this is one of the reasons why it was so frustrating for police back when they were committing very significant resources to this investigation Absolutely. And as a listener, you find yourself, you know, following you down those rabbit holes and thinking it has to be this person, it has to be this person. And then, you know, flipping, changing your mind to the next episode. It's it's fascinating to have, as you say, that many people of, of interest and ones that might have had the same car or a questionable history or, or whatever it is. It just feels like it's a it's a can of worms that doesn't appear to be slowing down. There's just more and more information coming out. And there's clearly been a lot in the Bathurst community that people have been holding on to. So I can imagine that trying to separate fact from, well, even myth, there seems to be, you know, a lot of myths in the community and separating the facts from the myths must be quite a task. Yeah, look, that's so right. The podcast has been trying to do, I've been trying to do, you know, what I call myth busting in this investigation as well Mm. because the myths and the rumours and the innuendo, they've got in the way of there being the potential to unlock this secret. If people are heavily invested, for example, in the rumour and the innuendo that the former deputy mayor and and detective sergeant making a pretty innocuous comment to a friend about the good sort working across the way in Ned Harry's menswear, if that suddenly becomes, you know, beaten up into, you know, you're a murder suspect and you're branded that for 19 years, you can imagine how debilitating that would be to the police investigation when the cops are saying, no, look, he was just a bit of a flirt. He didn't kill anyone and let's move on. The public think that's a cover-up. And I think Bathurst being a country town, a lot of people, they do know each other. Rumour and scuttlebutt and innuendo it travels very fast and the police in 2001 and two and then in 2006 7 8 and 9 in the lead up to the inquest and and through the police integrity commission investigations they were coming up against this extraordinary network of of rumour, unsubstantiated gossip. I've come up against it as well, but what I've wanted to do is try and nip in the bud some of the the things that would have got in the way of my investigation. And one of those was this idea that the cop, even though it's a really sexy angle, you know, a copper accused possibly guilty of murdering this, this beautiful young woman, but I think it's a, a nonsense. And I wanted to sort of get through that pretty quickly so that this idea that Hosemans might have done it wouldn't contaminate the rest of the investigation and distract people. But there are still many people in Bathurst who are absolutely convinced, even though there isn't a skerrick of evidence to point to him. Mm, you can see why it's a an appealing headline. It's a it's the headline you'd, you'd want to run in terms of it being interesting and, and surprising. But as you say, it, there just doesn't appear to be any evidence. And hopefully putting him aside means that, you know, the other leads can be properly investigated rather than being obscured by this other story. And it looks, you know, every episode it looks like you're getting closer and closer and we can't wait for the next few that come out when you can do a little bit more research and bring us some new leads. Yeah, thanks, Jess. Um, I'm hoping that, um, you know, we'll have time over the period between the ninth and then the concluding episodes to to really run down a few of these promising leads that have come in and and return with something that might change things. But, you know, it's just, it's such a tough case. We think that we might be getting closer sometimes and then we discover something that just, you know, unfortunately just makes that particular lead unviable. But touch wood, you know, there's still... People in Bathurst who know, I, I believe, who know what's happened 
and uh, there's a $1 million reward mm. for someone who does come forward with this evidence that could identify the killer, it's a good time to do that now. Well, best of luck and we'll be listening. Thank you so much for your time. You're welcome, Jess. It's a pleasure. You can listen to Headley Thomas's new podcast, The Night Driver, at thenightdriver.com.au or if you scroll down, you'll find a link in the show notes. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Jesse Stevens. Our producer is Lem Zakaria. If you'd like to find out more about the show, don't forget to join our online community. Just search for True Crime Conversations on Facebook and make a request to join.